Okay, everybody. How you doing? It is uh, Wednesday night, the 3rd of April. Nate Eaton coming to you live from my hotel room in Boise, Idaho. This is Courtroom Insider. Walked into my room just a few minutes ago because court got out super late today, but there was major progress in jury selection. So I want to thank you for being here tonight, and I want you to let me know where you're watching from. And also let me know if you have any questions that I can maybe answer today about the trial. There was some major, major movement today. It was a very long day. Um, normally, you know, the court doesn't go this long, but I, I think I've been in here for about five minutes and um, I want to talk about everything that went on today and uh, everything that happened and give you the, the latest update on everything that's happened. So this is Courtroom Insider in case you are new to the program or just tuning in every night through the remainder of the Chad Daybell trial, which is several weeks. I break down everything that happened in court that day. There are cameras in the courtroom, but they are court supplied and they are court supplied microphones. And I know many of you watching the live stream say that you're pretty disappointed in the quality. And um, I've seen it. I, I agree. I wish that it was better cameras. I wish that the media was running the cameras. But we're glad that Judge Boyce did allow these these courtroom cameras to be set up. Uh, but we just can't control the microphones or the or the uh, the imagery. So thank you for tuning into this. In, in case you don't have time all day to watch. I'm posting live updates every couple of minutes throughout the day, so you can go read those on eastidahonews.com. You can also read them on my Twitter page. I have to give a shout out to a wonderful couple who showed up today right after lunch, and uh, Linda and Ken. Here's the funny thing. We had such a short period of time for lunch today that I thought, oh, I wonder if I have time to run to the grocery store. I, I eat lunch in my car, but I thought, I wonder if I'll have time to run to the grocery store and get some Smarties or some candy to keep me awake this afternoon, because I figured it'd be a little long, and you're sitting there the whole time. And I walk into the courtroom, and Linda and Ken hand me this, a seat pad. How kind is that? Like a deluxe one. And they have a goodie bag for me, and inside the goodie bag, of course, Smarties. And uh, a big old bag, one of those huge ones of hot tamales. So you can see that I opened them and that I was eating them this afternoon. And a big thanks to Linda and Ken for bringing those. And um, also I mentioned Chipotle last night that we don't have Chipotle in Idaho Falls. And I look forward to having it here. And somebody out there, I just want to thank you for um, sending a gift card in my email. That was just so polite. Okay, enough about that. I do appreciate all of you. I want to know where you're watching from. Let's get the show on the road. It is jury selection day three, courtroom inside of the Chad Daybell case tonight. We're going to talk about what happened. We're going to talk how close we are to actually getting a jury. Nancy Grace is going to chime in. I recorded an interview with her on Zoom and it was very much like Nancy Grace. What happens next with the trial? We're going to remember JJ, Tylee, and Tammy, and I want to answer your questions, and I understand that several of you have sent in questions. Peggy, our moderator, reads through all your comments as we're here, and then she sends me your questions, so don't be afraid to ask if you have anything on your mind. Okay, here's where we are. Here's where we're at tonight. Two groups of 17 were questioned today. Now, why 17? Well, normally when they're 16. Well, remember yesterday there were two no-shows? The no-shows showed up today. One of them, the guy said that he uh, wakes up to his alarm clock and he overslept yesterday. And by the time he got to his phone, or he wakes up to his phone, that's his alarm clock. It was somehow unplugged. He overslept. It was very apologetic. The other was a lady who um, got, just was confused by the instructions, called in, was supposed to be there anyway. Sounds like there was a, a lot of confusion there. Both were apologetic. They didn't get into trouble or anything. Um, but they did show up today. So there were two groups of 17 rather than two groups of 16. We need 50 potential jurors before a jury is picked. And that's the number the judge set. Some of you have emailed saying, I thought it was 42 or 43. That was in Lori Vallow's case. This is a different case. And that's the number that was agreed upon with the defense, the prosecutors, and the judge. So this is where we're at as of 30 minutes ago. 17 jurors advanced today. We have a total pool of 37, consisting of 17 men and 20 women. We only need 13, 
13 more and we've hit 50. That could happen tomorrow. We had 16 picked on the first day. We had 17 picked today. There are two groups of 16 coming tomorrow. I'm quite confident that we will hit it or we'll, we'll be very close. So we just need 13. So then what happens? After they have the, the group of 50, they call them all back. And it could be Friday morning. They call them all back to the courthouse. And then the defense and the prosecutors each get a certain number of preemptory challenges. I don't remember off the top of my head. But whatever it is, we get down to 18. So let me just do some math here. If we have 50 minus 18, that's 32 divided by 2, 16. So I, I believe they each get 16 preemptory challenges where they can go through the the forms they have and automatically kick out 16 people for no reasons at all. Just goodbye. Then we'll have the group of 18. Six will be alternates. 12 will be the jurors. They won't know who, who is who. At least they didn't in Lori Vallow's case until the end of the trial, right before deliberations began. So that could happen Friday morning. And that's exactly what happened in Lori Vallow's case. It happened Friday morning. It, we ended around 10 o'clock. Judge sent everybody home for the weekend. Prosecutors prepared opening uh, statements. Defense prepared opening statements. And Monday, boom, it was off to the races. And it just took off. I have a feeling that could happen. Unless something major happens tomorrow, that, that could happen. So there's where we stand today. Again, if you're just tuning in, 17 jurors advanced today. We have a total pool of 37 consisting of 17 women and 20 men. We've got to get to 50, and it was major progress tonight, today, here at the courthouse. Um, okay, so with that, why don't we get to Nancy Grace and hear what she has to say. Now, a little caveat. I know many of you don't like Nancy. I know many of you love Nancy Grace. I've had several of you email saying, why would I even talk to her? Why would I go on her show? Um, I, I went on Nancy's show at the beginning of this case because those kids were missing, and I wanted to you know, tell it wherever I could and let people know that these kids are out there. And Nancy Grace has a large platform. I went on a couple of other shows in the beginning. Uh, but Nancy Grace um, also you know, was a prosecutor. She also has some interesting insights. So whether you love her or hate her, I'm going to play the interview. Um, and uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about it in the comments. And we'll come back on the other side and we will talk about it. So let me get that all queued up here. Nancy, always good to see you. It's been four years. Can you believe it? Uh, can you believe the Chad Daybell trial is finally here? Well, it's been a long time coming and justice has certainly moved at a glacial pace. I am surprised it's taken this long, even with all the jurisdictional issues and the complexities of a severance, which means you have to sever, split apart the two co-defendants. Uh, but I am surprised it's taken this long. And I, I find that to be very difficult for victims' families to have to wait this long for justice. So let's get the show on the road. So a lot of people, Nancy, thought after Lori Vallow was found guilty on all counts, three life sentences. Now she's down in Arizona, uh, charged in the death of her fourth husband and the attempted death of her nephew-in-law. Um, why didn't Chad take a plea agreement? You're kidding me, right? Wait, what? is that Nate? Has someone like killed you and is wearing your skin? Because, Nate, this is the guy that calls himself the prophet, he is clearly very impressed with himself. No way is this guy going to plead guilty. He's going to try to blame it all on cult mom Lori Vallow. Of course, he's not going to plead guilty. Well, you he remember. He probably thinks he can snow a jury just like he snowed everybody else. All those people that believe his line of BS, technical legal term. Hopefully, this jury can see through his lies. Well, that that's the you make a point there, Nancy, that, uh, you know, Lori, she didn't present a defense. They just said, you know, it's going to rest. And then you remember at her sentencing, she read how Jesus is her friend and and all of that. Chad will have a much different defense, according to his attorney. Do you think it's just going to point at Lori, point at Alex, go after those two? Absolutely. He's going to have a hard time explaining why the bodies or the remains, especially of Tylee. There's not much of a body left, just a bucket of flesh and, and, and singed fat. It's so hard to say it like that. 
But that's true. That's going to be a tough thing for any jury mate to hear those facts. I've actually seen jurors wince when I would describe a crime scene or turn away from uh, demonstrative or actual physical evidence because it's it's so upsetting. Um, I, I like to think of JJ and Tylee as they were in life. It's very difficult for me to think of Tylee and a buck as a bucket of flesh because that's what she was. Uh, back to my original line of thought, it's going to be very difficult for Chad Daybell, the prophet, <laughs> that just chokes him out in my mouth. These two beautiful children were basically in his backyard in the pet cemetery. That's no accident. He didn't notice disturbed dirt there. And when, remember when he was on the phone with cult mom, Lori Vallow, he went, uh, yeah, the, the police are here searching. Well, I can tell you this, Nate Eaton. If the police were digging up my backyard, I would be raising H-E-double-O. What the hey? But he was like pretty okay with it. I can't wait for the jury to hear that phone call. Well, the other call they'll probably play is uh, when the police were called when Tammy Daybell was found dead in her house. Lori was just car uh, charged with conspiracy for her murder. Chad's actually charged with her murder. So for the average person you know, watching, what does that tell us? Why did prosecutors go for murder and conspiracy on Chad, but just conspiracy on Lori? Number one, what are you planning to invite them over for dinner after the trial? Why do you call them by the first name? You know how much I hate that. Bello and that, Daybell, yeah. But that said, uh, I think the charging is wrong. I've tried a lot of homicides, spree homicides, serial killers, uh, regular homicides where there's one victim and one killer. I think she, cult mom Lori Bella, should have been charged with murder as an accomplice to murder. Yes, she may not have been the one that actually asphyxiated Tammy Daybell. May she rest in peace. But she was in on it. It's not like you and I plan a bank heist. And I go in with the gun and get the money, but you help me plan it. You may even be the mastermind. It all it goes back to that Amazon purchase for me regarding Tammy Daybell. Colt Montlory Valley goes online with a, a, hus a dad husband's credit card and buys her quote, beach, B-E-A-C-H, wedding dress. That's what she searched for. A ring and Chad Daybell's outfit to wear at the wedding. And then in fact, and this is all while Tammy's alive. And then they in fact do go to Hawaii and they have a beachside wedding. And the pictures just throw me over the edge of them out there doing the hula in the water, near the water. Then after she orders her wedding dress and Chad Daybell's groom's, out, groom's outfit and the ring, then Tammy conveniently dies. Oh, yeah, she should be charged as an accomplice to murder. Those two need to stew in the same pot. But that said, the prosecutors, I think, uh, took a, a route that guarantees them a conviction. Uh, and right. Obviously, she helped plan the murder. And uh, I, I'm just curious, uh, you may have to jog my memory. When did they buy their plane tickets and arrange where they were going to stay? I know you know, because I recognize your hand now, because you were chasing cult mom, Lori Vallow, and I could see your hand holding a microphone. Hey, where are your children? Are you worried about your children? That was you. So everything was prearranged. They only had to wait for Tammy to die. And bam. She did. So you got two choices, Nate Eaton. Either cult mom Lori Vallow was clairvoyant or she's a killer. And I insist she is not clairvoyant. Well, thank you, Nancy. The trial, of course, underway, jury selection, and uh, it's a death penalty case. So we could be, you know, in this trial for eight to 10. Oh, man. Shoot, shoot. I don't know what happened here. My computer, of course, is doing a reboot right when we're on the air here. I'm going to rewind that just a little bit so you can catch the end of the interview here. My apologies. Um, let me let me start. Let me just play the tell in. There's about a minute 
or so left on this if that um okay nancy go. always good to see you it's been four years can you believe it uh, can you where we were here we go okay it's a route yeah. that guarantees them a conviction uh and that is conspiracy did she help plan the murder right. obviously she helped plan the murder and uh, I, i'm just curious uh, you may have to jog my memory when did they buy their plane tickets and arrange where they were going to stay i know you know because i recognize your hand now because you were chasing oh, caught mom Lori Vallow, and i could see your hand holding a microphone hey where are your children are you worried about your children that was you so everything was pre-arranged they only had to wait for tammy to die and bam she did so you got two choices nate eaton Either cult mom Lori Vallow was clairvoyant or she's a killer. And I insist she is not clairvoyant. Well, thank you, Nancy. The trial, of course, underway, jury selection, and uh, it's a death penalty case. So we could be, you know, in this trial for eight to 10 weeks. Appreciate you chatting with me. Boo hoo, eight to 10 weeks. Her family, Tammy Daybell's family, and J.J. and Tyler is what's left of their family. Have a life sentence of life without their loved ones. Eight weeks is a drop in the bucket. Right. Yep. Thank you, Nancy. One last word. Don't rush, Lady Justice. All right. There you go. Nancy Grace, always telling it like it is, not sugarcoating it. Don't rush, Lady Justice. My apologies for the glitches there. I'm going to post the entire interview after uh, this tonight. You can go back and watch it without the glitches if you want. Um, and um, some people were saying, was Nate Eaton trying not to laugh? I'm not laughing at the subject matter when I talk to her, but sometimes she just can be so Nancy-ish that I kind of smile and laugh because it's so, it's so much. Uh, but I remembered one of the first times I did her show, I kind of laughed at one point and then I realized that that's, that doesn't come across as good. I was not laughing at the situation, but anyway, thank you to Nancy for talking with me. She also has been on this story or been following our reporting and whatnot from the beginning. And, and, um, you can go back and check that out. All right. So I wish, I wish that, um, I could have come on tonight and said, yeah, we have the jury picked, but I know so many of you have questions about the jury that are coming in, and I think that might just be the best way to address it. I can just read through these questions. But before we go, I want to show you some beautiful photos of JJ and Tylee. And um, look at this fun one of, of JJ jumping into the pool. Uh, just a cute little boy. I think of my little boys every time I see this. Right now they're at soccer. They're starting soccer for the first the season. Um, this week and i just think about jj you know jumping into that pool loving the water here's a beautiful photo of tylee i love doing her hair and putting on makeup and then actually tylee took this next photo of jj look at that look how beautiful that is um him playing in the water with the sun setting behind her tylee was such a talented photographer from what everybody tells me and i i went to a memorial service for her a few years ago and they had her art her her photos displayed all around the the room and she was really good like beautiful enough to have them on your you know screenshot or a calendar or something just beautiful pictures and here she is as a as a toddler cute little girl um this reminds me when i see this picture of when we visited that storage unit in rexburg and opened up the door not knowing what would be in there and there were all these photos of jj and tylee and colby and the blankets, they each had a blanket. JJ had his blanket and Tylee had her blanket. And it was baby photos of all of them on the, um, on, on this blanket and on these blankets. And they were just so, so adorable. Anyway, tonight we remember Tylee and JJ and Tammy Daybell and Charles as well as, um, the fight for justice on their behalf continues here in Ada County. Okay, let me get to some of your questions. You can still send them in. Let me know what you think. Um, and I will answer as many as I can. But first, it looks like we have some shout outs. Sandy Hiskey, Jackie Jensen, Inez Halson, Judy Grady, Emily Ruth, Marjorie Swift from Australia, Sydney, Rhonda Rawson, Renee Johnson, Paula McDonald, Ruth York, and Ellen Dickey. I think that they're um, all women. 
So thank you. Thank you, ladies, for following, and thank you for watching, and thank you for being so interested in this case. Uh, you know, that is one, uh, one question I have for you all. Why? What is it about this case that got you interested? What was it? Was was there something different about it? Was there something? Um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of stuff different about it. But I'm always amazed that those of you in Sweden and Europe and Australia and New Zealand are messaging me saying, "What? What? You're 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 fascinated by it." I had a friend in Australia message me late last night. I guess that one of the original shows that we did years ago was airing, and so um, let me know why you're interested in it. Okay, here we go with, with your questions. Holly says, what's the difference of the death penalty versus life in prison without parole? I mean, I know that one is death, but what is the purpose of someone who is in a death penalty case getting life in prison without parole? So when the prosecutors file, when someone is charged with first degree murder, there is a state statute in Idaho that you, the prosecutors have to follow. If there are aggravating factors when that first degree murder is committed, such as a police officer was killed, more than one person was killed, the murder was particularly heinous or awful, uh, there's a bunch of statutes laid out in the law. The prosecutor then says, we are going to seek the death penalty on so-and-so. If it goes all the way, now a lot of times, I'll back up and say a lot of times they do that as a bargaining chip down the line for a plea agreement to say we could take this off the table and you could get life in prison without parole if the conditions are right. You plead guilty now, we'll take this off the table if the conditions are right. I do know mediation talks were held with Chad Daybell at least once and with Lori Vallow. They went nowhere. That's why we're here today. So then the, the prosecutor says, okay, it's death penalty. Then in a capital murder case such as this, there are only two options for sentencing. You can't go below life in prison without parole. You can't say, well, only 20 years in prison or, well, oh, only 10 or whatever. It's got to be life without parole or the death penalty. That's it. Lori Vallow, she got life without uh, parole, but she got three sentences, one for each of the murder charges. So she's serving three in a row. And... Um, the prosecutor very well in this case could have could have not filed the death penalty. And if they would not have, then on the first degree murder charge, I believe in Idaho, the minimum is 25 years. I'll have to double check. It might be 10. But you would either serve a minimum of 25. That's a fixed time in Idaho or maximum of life in prison. But because they went for the death penalty, those are the only two options. I hope that answers your question. You can go back and watch my interview the other day. Um, with um, John Thomas, uh, he, he kind of explained it pretty well. Ginny, from an outside perspective, it seems they are not being consistent in who advances and who is excused from jury duty. On Monday, there were possible jurors excused for travel plans, yet today a man with non-refundable airline tickets advanced. Also, some were excused Monday for issuing issues related to their job, time off without pay. Today, a man advanced after mentioning he would not get paid for four or more weeks. I feel bad for those who expressed hardship, but advanced anyway. Do you have a way you can explain this? You know, it kind of is on a case-by-case -case basis. And, no and normally what they'll do is they'll try to find maybe more than one hardship. Like, okay, you have a trip planned in May, but you also noted that you've watched Dateline, or today, East Idaho News was brought up. Someone was reading through our recaps in the Lori Vallow case. Then it gets a little bit stronger for the argument to release them. If someone's like, yeah, I got tickets for a plane. A, a guy today, he's waited his whole life. He's, I think he's a Detroit Lions fan. Waited his whole life for the NFL draft to come to Detroit. He got tickets. He told the judge this, but he still is on the pool. Now, th that doesn't mean he's going to serve on the jury, though. There's still a chance that when the final number comes on later on that he could be dismissed but there's still a chance so it is totally up to to how the prosecutors feel i mean and how the defense feel and how john Pryor feels just keep in mind we don't know everything they know these potential jurors have filled out thick thick questionnaires and and the prosecutors and the defense attorney and the judge knows 
all of the answers. We don't. So there could be one of those jurors that they're like, oh, they said this, this and this. They have travel plans. Let's dismiss them and make an argument to dismiss them. Or, oh, we really want them. They said this, this and this. Let's fight to keep them even though they have travel plans. So I hope that makes sense. By the way, if you were on the pool and were dismissed and you want to talk, message me. And I'd love to chat with you about your experience. But we would have to do it after jury duty is complete. So anyway, you can message me if you want. Um, okay. Ruth, has Chad continued writing? Uh, I had heard that Chad was going to write a new book, another book. But I don't, I don't, that's about all I know. I know that he spent a lot of time in the Fremont County jail with a laptop that had no internet with all of the evidence stored on it and a transcript of the whole trial. So, um, that's what I know, but I don't know if he's writing a book. He, if he does write a book, he cannot make money on it if he's convicted. In Idaho, it's called the Slayer Laws. You cannot make a profit off of crimes that you commit. So just know that if a book is coming, he can't make money from it. Why do you think the police officer didn't seem to want to be a potential juror? That is what it seemed to me, but I could be wrong. That's a good question. So there was a police officer, I believe yesterday, or was it this morning? I don't remember. Um, he... He wanted to get off the jury trial. And I, I can kind of understand it. If you work in it, if you work in the business and you're dealing with, you know, uh, suspected criminals, criminals, um, you, 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 you might, I, I, he probably would have been disqualified anyway. I was surprised he wouldn't simply because he probably works with some of those bailiffs in the courtroom. Maybe he's worked with John Pryor. He did mention that he's done a case before with Ingrid Beatty, the AG attorney. So I was waiting for him to be dismissed, and he ultimately was. But, you know, I, as far as at least I, I'm pretty sure he was. Let me double check my notes. I don't want to tell you wrong. If you all were watching, um, let me know. I keep notes on every single juror that, that advances. I write down their number, and I write down a little bit about them. And I don't see him on my list, so I don't think he advanced. And then on, fr on well, whenever I say Friday, but whenever they're finalized, I'll go through and strike. And then I'll highlight the ones that make it into the final jury, just so I kind of have an idea who's who. I write down if they support the death penalty or not, and I'll, I'll see if there's a mix there. But I don't think the officer made it through. Would you want to serve on a jury? I would love to. I don't think they'll ever choose me, at least in Idaho Falls, because I... I know a lot of the judges. I know a lot of the bailiffs. I know a lot of the people at the court, but man, I would love to. My wife did once. Uh, we had just moved to Idaho Falls. I think we were only there three or four months. She got called up for jury duty and she went to the courthouse and the, the defendant came in and s they picked the jury. So she went back a second day and the defendant walked in and said, I want to take a plea agreement. So, yeah. Um, Amanda, did Lori ever live in Chad's house? Just wondering if they were there together, knowing the kids were in the backyard. I don't believe so. There's never been any evidence that Lori lived there. Remember that Lori moved to Rexburg, I believe in early September, late August of 2019. They went to Yellowstone, Tylee, JJ, Alex, and, uh, Lori over, I think it was Labor Day weekend around there. They came back. That was the last sighting of Tylee before she died. That was early September. Tammy was still alive, so no way Lori's going to live at that house with Tammy still alive. JJ dies two or three weeks later, and toward the end of September, around the 21st, 23rd, somewhere in there, uh, 23rd, I believe, he's then buried in the backyard. Tammy dies about a little less than a month later. So if, and then at, right after that, so there wasn't any time between the times the kids died and Tammy died that Lori would have moved into that house. She dies in October. They're in Hawaii early November. She had that other house in Rexburg. Remember that he told his family that he met, he told some of his family that he met her in Hawaii when he went over there, but really they went over to get married. He quickly left his wife's funeral to get up to Rexburg to see Lori. So, um, and told his kids that she was a friend. So I don't think that she ever moved into that house, though. I don't think that she ever lived there. I'm sure she visited, probably. 
Um, and she probably she knew where those kids were, that they were right outside in, in the, on the property. Naomi says, will you be covering this case at CrimeCon? Yes, Naomi, I will be. And I have to tell you that at CrimeCon, I will be interviewing Summer Shiflet, Lori Vallow's sister. And we will take to the stage in Nashville. It's the end of May. And for one hour, we I will interview her. And I know uh, some of you have strong feelings about Summer. Much like Nancy Grace, I believe in interviewing everyone, letting everyone have their say. And um, I'm not there to judge. Keith Morrison told me years ago, as a journalist, you can't be judgmental. You have to be curious. And I'm curious what Summer has to say. We haven't really talked about what we're going to talk about, um, but she has some things she wants to finally say. So that'll be at CrimeCon this year. And if you haven't been to CrimeCon, you can go. I don't get paid to go to CrimeCon. Um, I don't, they do, they do pay for my flight just in full transparency in my hotel. Uh, but, but I don't get paid to go there and I don't get paid to promote it or anything, but I've been two or three years now and it's been fascinating. And I've met many of you there and I'm trying to convince Erica to come. Don't you think Erica should come? So what'll be fascinating is crime con is the end of May in Nashville, I think the 30th. And we could have, we may have a verdict like days before. Now, if we're on verdict watch that Friday, my plans for pr crime con might change a bit because I'll need to stick around for the verdict, but it will be very timely to talk about this case. And I interviewed Larry and Kay Woodcock at crime, con crime con years ago. And, uh, I think that was in Las Vegas and, and it was just so good to have them on stage. It, I know the next question is going to be, will it be televised? It won't be. I'm sorry, but I believe that they'll put it on their website after the fact and, and you can pay a much lower rate, like a membership of uh, like five or 10 bucks a month and you can go on and watch everything at CrimeCon. Um, so yeah, I'll be at CrimeCon and I'll be with Summer Shiflet there. And if there's anything you want me to ask her, you can uh, let me know below. I did have someone send me, and maybe you're watching, a very angry email, s furious that I booked, that saying that I booked Summer for CrimeCon. First of all, I don't book. I don't do the bookings. And um, they do the bookings, but, you know, obviously I've covered this story and so they paired up the two of us together. Um, what will happen to the two jurors that didn't show? Heather asks. Well, they showed up today, but I did look, and according to Idaho law, if you miss jury duty, you can face jail time and a $500 fine. They were not issued any of those that I know. They were apologetic. They missed it, but I'm sure if, you know, the deputies had to go to their house, the bailiffs had to go to their house and say, where were you? They could have faced some further punishment. Rebel. First, will Melanie Boudreau be testifying in Chad's trial, and will Melanie Gibb testify as well? Okay, I don't know because the 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 uh, witness list is sealed. Both, well, Melanie Gibb testified at Lori's, and I'm I can almost guarantee she'll be at this one. And Melanie Boudreau, now Pulowski, um, was supposed to testify at Lori's, but she didn't. And I I don't know if she's on the list for this one. It'll be interesting. It will be interesting. I wish we had a list. There we know there's a long list of potential jurors or uh, potential witnesses that could testify, but we don't know exactly who those witnesses will be. So it's a possibility. Nate, why is the news or even you not calling Chad a false prophet instead of giving him credibility? I'll watch and see if you report the truth. I'm expecting a message from Nate. If you are a true reporter, report the truth. Okay. Well, I can tell you that Chad is a false prophet. Uh, in at least in many people's point of view, I would not call him a prophet, a true prophet. He did predict the world was going to end in July of 2020 and it didn't. So whoever you are, I don't have a name on this one. Um, I, I am reporting that he is, he is not a true prophet. Uh, as far as giving him credibility, I don't think we are giving him credibility. We're reporting the facts. My, my job is to report the facts without fear or favor. And sometimes that can get a little tricky. And sometimes there's not, not necessarily in this case, people that try to persuade you to do one way or the other. John Pryor made a big to do today about sensationalism and the media and using specific images that grab people and, and headlines. And you know what? I kind of agree with a lot of what he said in a lot of cases, but not in every case. If you ever say all lawyers are bad, 
Well, some are bad, some are good. All media is bad. I don't know what that even means. Some are good, some are bad. I try to be right down the middle. So I hope that I cleared up what you're saying about Chad being a false prophet. Were Tammy Daybell's autopsy results ever made public? Yeah, they were. They got them done. Oh, it's, I, I don't know if you mean like a written document. We never saw a written document, but they did get them done and they released the autopsy reports or they said that they were done before the trial, before Lori Vallow's trial started, but then they released the results in her trial and said she died of asphyxiation. And then they went on to the medical examiner, went on to say that she had marks on her uh, upper arms, I believe, and that it was likely that she was held down when she died. So we have that reporting. If you go to our website, you can find it. But but if you're looking for like an actual report, like we got Alex Cox's autopsy report. I think we posted it. Um, we don't have that. It will come out at the end of Chad's trial. At the end of, so many of you are saying, who aren't in the courtroom, how can I see all of the evidence? How can I see all of the exhibits? How can I see everything that's been referenced? Normally at the end of a trial, after a certain amount of time, I don't know if it's 30 or 60 days or whatever, it's open to the public. You legally have a right to go down to the courthouse and request to see it. You might have to pay if you want copies of the stuff, but, or... Uh, on certain cases, you there might be a fee if you want a disc or something, but you can you can request those. But after Lori's trial, the judge sealed it, sealed all of the evidence, and then um, it will be released after Chad's trial because this trial was coming up. So you at that point will will likely have the hard copy. I don't know if there'll be much new in any of the evidence once it's open, other than the horrible photos, which I never want to see again. I'm sure we'll see them in the next week or so. But um, there's other things, too, that we we uh, that you don't want to see. But maybe you want to if you're curious. Lori Vallow's attorney, whom you interviewed, John Thomas, mentioned that in death penalty cases, the defense has a first chair attorney and a second chair attorney. Does Chad just have John Pryor for his attorney and no one else? That's from Lee. You're right, Lee. Yes, he does because he is not, well, at least he wasn't indigent. He, he, John Pryor is a privately retained attorney. And because of that, he can represent him by himself. Whereas if Chad Daybell had asked for a public defender, which he could have because he's not working, then he would have automatically been given a first chair and a second chair. Would have been interesting because in Eastern Idaho, we don't have a, a lot of death penalty attorneys because these trials rarely go all the way. We have Jim Archibald and John Thomas. So we probably would have been given attorneys from another part of the state and then the trial would have been delayed likely even more. So could you imagine that? So um, he only he only has the one attorney and John Pryor's never done a death penalty case. So we'll see how it goes. And that this ties into that. I know John Pryor tried to jump ship a few weeks ago due to the workload. Why doesn't he have co-counsel helping him? Does Idaho not provide the second attorney in death penalty cases? Same answer. He could have hired a second attorney to assist, but Chad doesn't have any money. He John Pryor said that months ago when he tried to get off the case that his client could no longer pay him. And the judge said, no, you're staying on the case. So I don't know who he would have hired. who would have done it for free. I don't know. Should have thought of that, that probably two or three years ago. Can Chad just ask for a plea at any time, Darlene? Yeah, he can. Well, he can. The prosecutor doesn't have to take it. But if Chad Dabo walked in the courtroom tomorrow and said, all right, I will plead guilty to all of this. Just give me life in prison. Guaranteed the prosecutors would take it. I shouldn't say guaranteed. I'm pretty confident the prosecutors would take it. Because imagine how much money and time you would say. And also there is the risk that you don't get a conviction. But it would save the next two two months of our lives if Chad Daybell did that. I don't think he'll do that, but it's possible he could do it. Donna says, did the potential jurors know in advance on the questionnaire that this was Chad Daybell's case, or did they get notified once they entered the courtroom? The questionnaire did not, as far as I know, I haven't seen the questionnaire, but as far as I know, it was not mentioned that it was Chad Daybell's case, but there were a lot of questions that you could likely infer, such as death penalty, murder, things like that. Um, but when they arrived at the courthouse, there was chatter. That's when most of them learned that it was the Chad Daybell case. Now, people that live in Ada County and that follow any sort of news likely knew that, that there was this Chad Daybell case going on. So they probably suspected, um, and especially if they got the questionnaire, I talked to, to, um, 
uh, a lot of people who say their spouses were like, oh, it's the Chad Daybell case. Like Saul Hernandez, he was a juror last year. He told me that, that he didn't know what the Lori Vallow case was, but his wife was all over it. And she said, it's the Lori Vallow case. Are there limits to what the attorneys can ask the jurors? Um, yeah, I don't think that you can. There, there are limits. You have to stay within the scope of specific things, such as when they talk about hardship for uh, financial reasons for your job. You can't start talking about, well, did you have a child who died? You can't do that. When you talk about the hardship for um, like personal, like you have to travel or there's a funeral, you got to stay there. And then on the death penalty, you kind of got to stay on topic. They can't ask which faith they belong to. You can't discriminate against a jury. They can't ask your uh, sexual orientation. You can't discriminate someone because they're gay or transgender or whatever. Uh, you can't discriminate against them because of their skin color, obviously. So you couldn't ask like, you know, are you, are you Mormon? You know, but they did get around a couple of things because they talked that in this case, there'll be discussion of religion and, and do, do the jurors, are they okay with someone who might not believe have the same religious beliefs? So it kind of was talked about in a roundabout way. Uh, Emily asked if John Pryor pointed at me, <laughs> I think he did today. Actually, he went off about the media pointed at me. He mentioned East Idaho news. I'm, I guess I'm used to it. That is what it is. Um, do you have a list of jurors numbers that have been chosen? Shalene asks, I do. I'm not going to read them all here, but I do. And, um, yeah, I do. I'm curious to know who the gentleman that's sitting in the gallery behind the prosecutor is. Oh, good job. Good question, Eddie. That is Vince Kayakamanu. Vinny. And he is the chief deputy with the, the Madison County Sheriff's Office. He, Kai Kamanu, say that. I couldn't say it last year. I can say it now. And I've known the guy for like 20 years. But he um, was the lead, one of the lead investigators with Fremont County Sheriff's Office. And he has since been asked by Sheriff Ron Ball, who's now a sheriff, in Madison County to be his chief deputy. If you remember in Lori Vallow's case, Detective Ray Hermosillo with the Rexburg Police Department was in the courtroom every day. They, they can have one investigator in there every single day for every single moment. And in this case, it's Kaya Kamanu. So he's the guy that sits there, makes sure in case, you know, he's there to ba not really assist the prosecutors, but to be there and keep an eye on things and make sure it's there. I sit behind him. So you can maybe see all the blurry bubbles. I've been sitting on that side. Today I was off to the side in a cushioned chair because uh, those benches are hard. But thanks to our, the couple that brought me that cushion. Do Chad and Lori communicate? Um, not as far as I know. Why did John Pryor hire an investigator from Leslie? Um, he hired an investigator because he should have. Because all defense attorneys, especially in a death penalty case, should. Because you really need to find as much information as you can on all of the witnesses. Lori Vallow had a PI. Her defense team had a PI. And his job was to find as much as he could to discredit the witnesses or at least bring additional information to light. So, yeah, he does have a, an investigator there assisting him. I cannot imagine trying to do this all alone on, on his behalf. That would just be insane. And then Glenn asks, can Chad make money on a book if it's not related to the case? Ooh. Well, I guess he could because technically if his books are selling right now, I, I guess he's making money or someone's making money. But um, I don't know. I, I, I don't I, I if he if he's found guilty, he's going to have a large penalty to pay. So I think that if he does make any money, not not just his life, but there'll be a fine, too. And he'll have to pay court fees. Will he ever pay it back? Most likely not. But if he does make money somehow, um, it would probably go to that. Great questions. You all are so smart. And I wish that I could get through them all. I do want to show you a photo before I say goodnight to you and go have dinner. Again, court was running so late today. Um, I, th for the first time in, I'm airdropping this picture from my phone to my computer to show you. For the first time ever tonight, when I walked out of the courtroom, courthouse, it was just me. Everyone else had left. I, I say just me, but I do have to give credit to Tiffany from Court TV. She was the producer who stuck around till the very end. It was just the two of us. 
slaying it out until the very end just for you because I knew I had to come back and tell you what happened in those last minutes of court. So I had to take this picture to remember it because normally those steps, well, at least during Lori's case, were covered with media, covered with people. But tonight it was just me. I thought this will never, ever, ever happen again where I'm the only one outside the courthouse and uh, just, you know, had to fill you in and let you know too, excuse me, that if I'm a little late, at least tomorrow, they're going to have two more groups of jurors come, one at 8.30 and one at 1.30. Tonight I got out of there around 6.10 and rushed back here to, to go on with you. If I'm a little late tomorrow, you'll understand, I hope. But there's a chance tomorrow, I mean, think about it. If that first group of 16 goes in, we only need 13 more. I don't know if they'll get 13 from there, but they might. It'd be a push. But by the afternoon, we could have we could have it. So tomorrow night at this time, we could have it. And I hope you'll tune in tomorrow night because I'll let you know. And you can follow along. Here's how you do it. Let me find your the button here. Watch every day starting at 8.30 on our YouTube if you want to. You can follow live written updates. Many of you have asked where those are. They're at eastidahonews.com. I do the Courtroom Insider every night. We have our comprehensive video library. And here's how you can get me directly. My reporter page is right there. My Instagram is right there. I'm on X and then our YouTube channel too. We also have a little family YouTube called Meet in the Eatons that I know some of you are watching this on. Um, I'm not really pushing that because that's more of a family thing, but I know many of you found us that way. So uh, if you scroll back, you'll probably find some really embarrassing videos. I apologize about that. Like uh, us singing our baby announcements when we had kids. <laughs> we, we made Good Morning America and and then we've done it ever since, and I look back and cringe, and so does my wife. But anyway, uh, that's beside the point. But here's how you can keep in touch with me as uh, the weeks go by. And um, tomorrow I will let you know just what what you have. Subscribe to us on YouTube if you have not. That's how you can find out when we're live. And you, all you have to do, this little pop-up will come on. Hit the bell. Hit the thumbs up. And that's how you can subscribe. And many of you... Um, we are an independent local newsroom. If you want to, we, uh, we do take donations, but don't feel obligated to that um, because I'm just glad you're here. Okay, thank you all for watching. Let me know if you have suggestions for dinner because I'm going to go eat dinner. It's late, and we will see you back here tomorrow night on another Courtroom Insider.